Okay, hi everybody. I'm Simon from the Java User Group, and uh, I'm very happy to have Greg and beside his uh, Jonathan uh, online. He will talk about time travel debugging with of Java applications. And uh, before we start, uh, let's thank our sponsors that uh, without them, we wouldn't be able to do such great events. And um, we are also very happy um, to have people from all over the world now because we can do uh, online talks. So it changed a bit from what we did before. Uh, first, some technical information. Um, we will have uh, a few uh, tabs that you can choose from. In the Big Marker UI, first you have a chat where you can um, chat with uh, other attendees or Marcos will be there and uh, help with uh, technical issues. And then we have a Q&A section where you can ask a question to Greg. I will collect them and uh, find the right moment to ask them to Greg or Jonathan. Jonathan will do a short uh, demonstration um, also. So something is important to note this uh, because uh, we want to give you the best uh, experience that we can. So we have a little delay of 10 to 15 seconds. So that will also be a bit tricky if you ask questions and you don't immediately will get uh, the answer. That will be probably because of the delay here. After the talk, you will uh, be able to provide some feedback. You will get an email with a link to the feedback form. Um, we will be very happy if you can uh, give us your feedback. Also, Greg is interested in the feedback for sure. And we will have uh, an IntelliJ license uh, for the toolbox to give away every month. So if you let your email address, we can uh, have you in the pot and maybe you are lucky and will win uh, such a IntelliJ license. Then after the talk, you're all invited to join us on WonderMe. WonderMe is a platform where we can meet and uh, talk together. Uh, you will be re redirected to WonderMe uh, after the talk. So stay online and wait for the redirect. Um, unfortunately, we can't provide you with uh, food and drink today because of uh, the online uh, situation that we have here. But hopefully we'll get back to the uh, on-site events as well. Uh, during this year. So that's all from my side. And now I hand over to Greg. Um, please start your talk. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Hello, everybody. Uh, let me just make sure I'm, uh, yeah, get my, you can see my screen. It looks good. Um, yeah, right. So we're going to talk about uh, time traveling uh, debugging of, uh, of Java applications. All right. Now, uh there we go okay so to start with some context right i think debugging completely dominates programming right or, or rather like programming is debug. there's two kinds of programming there's bugging and debugging right there's writing the code in the first place and then there's making it work and you know making it work is actually the most most of the job right uh uh you know I, I would claim that most software is not understood by anybody, right? Nobody, in fact, I used to say, maybe if it's like nuclear power station software or flight control software, where every single line of code is poured over by a committee, maybe that's understood by everybody. But, e but now I think maybe even not, not even that, right? After the 737 MAX uh, 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 crashes. Now, you know, that wasn't like a, a classic software bug to cause the crash, but then when they poured over the, the software in the years that followed, they found all kinds of problems, right? And, and what it means is that the software is not understood, or in, in, the, the context in which the software is running is not understood, and exactly how the software behaves is not understood. We write this code, and we kind of go until like the tests pass, or at least not too many of them fail, and then we deploy, and then we find out, you know, what, what what's going wrong. So. So, so, so debugging completely dominates software, and it's something we don't really talk about, I think, as an industry. And 
another way to say debugging is asking this question, what happened, right? Now, uh, it, like all good questions, it's a much easier question to ask than to answer. And especially when it comes to software, right? It, a single thread on a single core is issuing literally billions of operations every second. And we probably have many threads and many processes communica communicating across many nodes. The whole thing is so complex. It's way more complicated than a human can understand. And Id identifying what went wrong is like this almost impossible task, at least at least a lot of the time, right? Um, and what, what do we do to find out what the, what's actually happening? Well, you know, we just have logging statements. Generally, most of the time, that's how most debugging is done. We just, the program emits some kind of logging statement. Maybe it's a printf. Maybe it's something a bit more fancy. It's some kind of logging framework. Maybe, uh, or, or, or maybe it's even some kind of performance, uh, you know, sort of APM performance monitoring system, but it's still essentially log points, right? And when we get, when the software fails in some way, like if we're really lucky, we might have a backtrace of a, of a, of a you know, a dozen or so kind of function calls and a small number of, 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 these, of these log messages, right? And the billions of instructions, every sort of hundred million or something, we might have a log point if we're lucky. So trying to deduce what happened from really very, very limited information is super hard, right? We kind of just get used to it as programmers because that's just what, what, we, what we do. Um, but it's, 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 what we, it's, it's just this colossal task that just completely dominates uh, software development. And I think you should, you know, there's another question then is, well, why can't the computer tell us, right? If we, we have all, all this colossal information, billions of operations every second, and we're trying to extract this tiny signal from this very noisy environment. Well, that's what computers are pretty good at, right? That's kind of what they're designed to do, walk over large amounts of data and, and tell us what we want to find out. So it's remarkable to me how, how little actually generally goes on with the computer telling us exactly what the program has done, right? So, you know, of those mil of those billions of instructions every second, you're looking for the one bad thing, right? Or those millions of lines of code, the one bad line of code. You know, it really is this this giant you know, needle in a haystack problem. And we can use we can use technology uh, to make this problem a lot easier, right? So a little bit like a, a metal detector on the on the haystack. So I'm going to give some context now. Uh, a sort of a, a brief kind of overview of the history of, of debugging, if you like. So this this chap here, this is Morris Wilkes. Uh, he has, I think, as good a claim as anybody to being the world's first programmer. Right? He was the first person to write software on a general purpose machine to solve a real problem, right? Not just a kind of, not, not a, 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 a specialized machine, but a general purpose machine and not a piece of code just to prove it worked, but to, but to actually solve the problem. It was some kind of, um, it was a biology problem to do with uh, to do with the sort of emerging field of genetics at the time. And so when he was writing code, this is what computers looked like, right? Computers were human beings, usually in those days, usually, usually women calculating, right? Providing answers. And he was, the, and so here we are at the beginning of the of the computer age. And, and, and Wilkes says in his memoirs that he remembers the time when he realized that a good part of the rest of his life was going to be spent finding errors in his own programs. Right. The the, the term debugging had yet to be uh, had yet to be sort of invented and, and popularized. Right. As many of us know, this was done by uh, uh, by by Grace Hopper and the machine that she worked on, where they actually found real bug inside the machine right this moth was inside the machine and causing it to go wrong now actually this is a trick this is a this is a, a false piece of information i like to i like to be pedantic and and, and, and point these things out and uh, in fact if this is the logbook here we can see this picture of the logbook with the with the bug taped into it and if you look at the reading underneath it says it's the first actual case of a bug being found, right? Which is a joke, right? Clearly, if you're saying that joke in the logbook is the first actual case of a bug, then then obviously this is a term that's in common use. And in fact, it goes back. Uh, it, it, uh, Edison refers to debugging in his logbook sometimes. But it, but but debugging has become part of. Uh, we think of software when we talk about bugs and debugging because it's because software has like the vast majority 
of the bugs in in, in all engineering, right? It's, a, it's something that human beings just really are not very good at. Here's another quote from uh, a, a very wise chap, Brian Kernigan, okay? He's you know, one of the inventors of C and Unix. And you may have heard this. This is, this is um, you probably, heard, you know, many of you will have heard this. Everyone knows that debugging is twice as hard as writing a program in the first place. So if you're as clever as you can be when you write it, how will you ever debug it? It's quite a, a, a very sort of clever, a wise statement. What he means, of course, is we should work, give ourselves margin for error, okay? Keep it simple. But I think there's an interesting corollary to this. I think if you think this through, what it means is that debugability is the limiting factor in software development, right? So if you, whatever your metric for how good the code is, whether it's how fast it runs or how small the code is or how quickly you can produce it or how extensible and understandable it is, whatever your metric for good is, if you can make it twice as debuggable, then your code will be twice as good, right? It's the limiting factor. And this is why, you know, if you want to be a, if you want to be a great programmer, you can't be a great programmer without being really good at debugging, right? The short Pete is computers are hard, right? It's just really hard to get software right. How many, think, how, how many lines of code do you back yourself to be able to write and have it work first time, right? I'd like to think of myself as a reasonably good programmer. I reckon mm, if, I'm, if I'm trying really hard, if I'm really honest, 20 lines maybe, right, on a good day. If I'm thinking how many lines of code of an existing system, especially one that I maybe don't understand very much, maybe that somebody else wrote, or maybe I wrote long enough ago that it may as well be somebody else, how many lines of that system can I change and have it work first time? And the answer to that question I find is depressingly close to zero, right? Just humans aren't very good at programming computers. We need, we need help. So another way of, 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 of talking about debugging is, to, is this question, as we said, what happened, right? Um, and particularly it gets really hard when a lot of time, any amount of time has gone between the bug itself and you noticing, or every time you run it, something, it behaves in a slightly different way, right? So if my bug is, uh, you know, if, I, if I'm sort of, if I'm lucky and uh, I get like a null pointer exception and I get a backtrace from that exception and I can see, oh yeah, I called this function and I passed in a null pointer and that was invalid, okay. I can, you know, I've got the, the, the point of the, the point of failure is very close to the actual root cause and I can see what happened and I can fix it quite quickly. And probably the majority of bugs, if you just count them, the volume of bugs, and especially if we count, you know, those bugs that don't even make it into source control that we debug in that kind of inner loop debugging, that's probably the majority of bugs. But it's where we spend the minority of our time, right? All the time goes into the smaller number of bugs when you have a long time between the bug itself and you noticing the effect, right? Or every time you run it, it does something different. Maybe it only happens one time in a million or one time in a thousand, or maybe it happens every time, but every time it's different. So I can't put in, you know, more like print statements or, or, or more logging points, or even with a debugger, put a breakpoint earlier on because every time it's different. So I can't kind of get information and home in on the bug. And of course, life gets really interesting when you're in the top right corner of this of this of this chart, right, of this matrix. When the bugs are non-repeatable and there's a long time. Um, I mean, we we had one I can go into with um, with with uh, uh, a, a customer I was talking to. Companies called Cadence, right? They make the the software that the chip people use. So their customers are people like Intel and Apple and and uh and qualcomm and people and um and and they had a bug in their system where uh it would the software would crash software would fail uh, about after about eight hours of execution about one run in 300 right and these and that, every time it did it it was just different there was just a different piece of memory that was just contained contained garbage and 
and and and it's just like almost impossible to track down. But you know, whenever you've got that gap, it, these 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 bugs just take all the time, right? And this is what causes software to be late, right? It's what causes software to be shipped. So much software is deployed and, and, and released with known defects, right? Nearly all software is because we just don't have time. We've got that time pressure to ship the software and we'd love to get rid of every single known bug and fix every single test failure, but we just don't have time, right? And, uh, and, and especially those tests that fail occasionally, non-deterministically, and we, we, you know, we, uh, or we sort of exclude them or we put them in quarantine uh, uh, or, or we put the results to ignore or however you think about it. And, uh, and we always think, I'll fix it next week because this week is this week is a really busy week for me. Next week's going to be easier, so I'll fix it then, right? And and of course, like next week, next week never is uh, ne 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 never is as easy as you think it's going to be. And so you just get this ever growing backlog of tests that fail some of the time, and no one knows why. And interestingly, there's been some some research that shows that thirty percent of production failures can be traced back directly or indirectly to a failing test, right? And I think you've probably all been there, right? There's that high high priority bug, you know, big impact, customer's very upset, whatever it is. And, you know, everybody like, I don't know, works kind of late nights or, or all weekend or something to try and uh, solve the crisis. And then you kind of finally figure out what it is and someone says, yeah, yeah, we actually, we had a test there that, that was failing six months ago and we just kind of turned it off to, to let our test suite pass, right? So all of these classes of, 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 of bugs and tracking down bugs is, is, is just, it dominates the whole software industry and everybody uh, uh, suffers the effects, right? We've all been there. So you don't have to be working in the technology industry to suffer the effects of buggy software. And so a little of a personal story here, but this, so this is sort of, you, you might be able to see the date at the top of this screenshot, 2006. This is when, so shortly after this, I, I came across this uh, amazing piece of work by a guy called Bill Lewis, really, really he's a really uh, very interesting guy. And, uh, and, and he had this kind of observation that, that, that he, we, we, we want the debugger to be able to tell us what happened, right? To be able to step back in time um, because could, traditional debuggers, yeah, they're not. They, we said that question is what happened. Traditional debuggers don't answer that question. Well, okay, you, maybe you get a stack trace, right? If you're if you're lucky, you might see some useful information in the stack trace. But that's a tiny sliver of what happened, right? There's a very small number of pieces of information about what happened. We really want to know what the program did. And so he came up with this solution where you can actually step back or run backwards and see all the data and see exactly what happened. And when I saw that, I was like, my mind was, you know, my mind was blown. I thought this is an amazing piece of technology. I looked into it further, and it turns out that actually uh, there, there are there are lots of examples of people trying to do this. There are there are research papers going back to the 1970s of people trying to do this, and and there are countless PhD projects of people building such a thing. What's really hard is to make it work at scale. Right? And I said before billions of operations every second lot, uh, and a single thread, lots of threads, lots of cores, lots of, lots of, lots of programs collaborating together. Making this kind of work at scale is a, is a big technical challenge. I'm going to talk a little bit about how, how, we, how, how that can be done uh, later on. But I think before I go any further, this is a good time now uh, for me to uh, hand over to my colleague, uh, Jonathan. Jonathan's our, our VP of product, and he's going to show uh, a nice little demo, which, uh, which is going to give, um, so you can actually get a flavor of what this really looks like. Uh, and demos are always so much better than slides, right? So, so Jonathan, uh, over to you. Hello, everyone. Um, let me just share my screen or steal the screen from Greg. So if we skip forward a decade and a half from what Greg was showing, maybe give it a sec.
I was just say well while, while, while Jonathan sets this up we'll talk at, at later on in the in the presentation there are there are a number of examples of these right that, that our company at undo we're not the only people kind of doing this by any means in fact Microsoft is getting into this in quite a big way now and I think it's really it's really something uh, who's uh, it's, a, it's an idea whose time has come um, and uh, it's beginning to be adopted you know across across not not just in Java across many languages um and 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 all kinds of different different systems so we'll look at some of the a review of some of the different uh, uh uh implementations that that are available but what you're about to see now um would give you a, a, a nice flavor for exactly what we mean by time travel debugging so greg can, I, can you see this yeah cool so this is um should hopefully look familiar to many of you this is uh, IntelliJ idea from JetBrains. Uh, it's running on Mac OS, but the program is actually debugging is running remotely on Linux. Uh, this looks probably like a normal um, IntelliJ session to you, but it's got some extra buttons that I'm going to play with. Um, the program it's debugging, or the application is about to crash out. It's called a concurrent modification exception, uh, which you can see down here. Um, and uh, concurrent modification exception comes in broadly two kinds. Um, there's the kind where you're iterating through some iterable, um, like an array or a list, um, and you uh, do something stupid like try and add or delete from the thing you're iterating over, and you get a concurrent modification exception. That's not what's going on here. As you, as we can see that um, we're just iterating through a list and yet we're getting an exception, but that's because we've hit the other kind of concurrent modification exception where you're iterating through your iterable and some other thread comes in and pokes at your iterable and maybe adds or deletes from it. And then you just blow up uh, as we've done here. So this is quite a difficult problem to solve. Uh, using traditional debugging techniques. I could add some logging here that Greg mentioned earlier. I could get a heap dump, but I doubt that's gonna tell me much. Uh, but as you might've guessed, this is a time travel debug presentation. So I'm gonna show what you can do if you actually have the ability to go back in time. So I said that this was a, a normal IntelliJ IDE, but it's got some extra buttons, one of which is reverse step over. So I can step back in time, go back, one line um, and I can keep stepping back, but I can also do some slightly more interesting things like I can use IntelliJ's standard uh, ability to uh, break on exceptions and I'll break on this concurrent modification exception. And then instead of just stepping back I can actually run back in time using this resume back button down here. And if I hit that, I go back to where the exception was actually thrown. And so here I'm actually running the program backwards and I'm in uh, some uh, standard library array list class that IntelliJ has helpfully um, uh, decompiled for me. So this is where the exception was thrown, but it's not actually where the exception, where the root problem was. Um, so to find that, I can uh, look at this internal variable, go to where it's implemented, set a watch point on this, and run further back in time. To where the problem was actually uh, generated that later calls this exception that we caught. So here I'm in some other thread, this mutator thread, and this is the thread that's come in and, and messed with my iteration. I can just look up the stack and yeah, here we are, it's adding something. So this is a toy program, obviously it's quite small, but I hope you can extrapolate from what I've shown here uh, to how this might manifest in, in a real application uh, where these kind of exceptions can be thrown and there can be some serious amount of time between the exception manifesting or the error manifesting and the error actually being inserted into the into the code into the application um, so 
I have one other demo um, uh, in a, a, a slightly more uh, demonstrating kind of software failure replay as well as time travel debug. For the moment, I'll, I'll hand back to Greg. Thanks, thanks for that, Jonathan. So, so you could see there how you know, we were navigating through time and we're able to step back. You can, you know, you can step back line by line, or you can step back to where you know the exception was thrown. You literally go back to a line of code that executed and and see any piece of of program state right so it's extremely powerful especially for for you know it's that what happened question extremely powerful especially uh, uh uh when you need to go back a little bit further in time i think it, it, i think jonathan mentioned it was interesting in that in that particular demo the 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 bug was detected when the thread that had the bug no longer existed Right, it was it now has gone out of context, and and despite the fact that, that at the moment the exception was caught, the thread no, the, the faulting thread no longer existed. You can go back in time to to when that thread did exist and see what it was doing. Right, um, so Jonathan, you you've got another demo. I'll, I'll do some a little bit more talking, and then we'll 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 switch back to your other demo. If that does that work? Yep. All right. Um, so I think I need to reshare screen. Here we go. All right. So, so there we've seen this this kind of this 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 new way of interrogating, getting the computer to tell us what happened. Another, and it's, so I'm going to talk a little bit now about like how how do you, how do you actually build this right and how do you make it work and, and how do you make it work at scale on, on you know, Jonathan said the program we were looking at there was a kind of toy program but but this this works now uh, on you know lots of really serious programs in fact Microsoft um, Microsoft are, in, uh, are now into time travel debugging in, in quite a big way and they had it internally um, uh, and and they actually didn't release it to the public until uh, just a couple of years ago. They had it internally for about 10 years before they were kind of ready to release it. And uh, uh, they got, in, the, in that time, 50% uh, of internal internally filed bug reports in Microsoft, in applications like Office, came with a recording of the failure, right? Well, they, they call it a trace, but it's the same thing, right? It's a file, it's a recording of the execution. And so, you know, the QA person or whoever can, can file that bug report with a recording and the engineer can just get like you know, just load that recording up and step through it and get straight to the bottom, straight to the bottom of the of the, of the problem, um, and and, uh, and 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 so yeah, how how do you make this? How you can kind of imagine how you might make it work for small programs and all these PhD projects and everything else that, that build something along these lines, but 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 how do we answer that question? Or how do we get the computer to answer the question of what happened? From running at scale. Well, let's first think about the problem itself. Think about why it, why it's actually not as easy as it might first seem. Because what happened really? That's another way of saying it, a more kind of precise way of stating the same question is what was the previous state? Right. I met this line of code. What was the state of my program immediately before? Now, there's two ways we can do this. Right. We because if you think about it, we can't we we, we we there's just there's some two two fundamental options we can we can save everything that's happening right so every time we change a variable or some piece of state in our program we just record what was the previous state right or or we can you can either do it every time you change it or you can do it every time you read from that piece of state you can just record what was what was read uh, and 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 that kind of works but it is difficult to scale because. It comes back to this point, like the same thing that makes the, the, the problem valuable is the same thing that makes it hard. This point I keep making, billions of operations every second, right? So if I'm, you know, and, and every operation is going to change some piece of state, otherwise I've gone into an infinite loop, right? If, I, if, if I'm not changing at least something, I've got to be at least changing the program counter. I'm probably changing some some loop counter or something. Um, otherwise I'm, I'm, I've gone into an infinite loop. So. So every operation is going to change some states. So I'm going to be saving some piece of state every, you know, billions of times a second. Then that log file is going to get very big very quickly, and the system is going to go quite, 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 very, really quite slowly as well because it's going to take a whole bunch of uh, CPU time to just 
just save that state each 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 instruction right or each bytecode operation or each line of code that runs whatever level we're working at so saving each piece of state to go back and see what it was like that's not really a very attractive option so the other thing i could maybe try and do is try and recompute that state try and deduce what the prior state was right that's that's harder than it might first seem though because let's take a statement like this right a equals a plus one that is a trivially reversible statement. If I know that line of code is just executed and I know the value of A, let's say A contain, let's say A is 42, then clearly it pre, you know, before that statement executed, A was 41, right? That's trivially reversible. But actually reversible statements, usually they're, they're a quite small minority of uh, a, a statement are reversible. Much more common is something like this. And that's not reversible. If I've just executed that instruction, A and B are both going to be the same thing. Let's say they both contain 42. I can't know what A was before that instruction executed. That's not, that's not reversible. In fact, even the first statement's not really reversible because that's, you know, that when you issue that instruction, you're probably going to have some kind of side effects, right? Like there's a, probably a flags register that's going to change. And I don't know what the flags register was before. In fact, if my program counter is right after that, that that first line of code, I don't even know that line of code executed. Like maybe I branched right there before it executed. So 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 like computers basically don't run backwards. You can't reverse the execution of a program. So yeah, but I mean actually slight slight tangent. You 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 can build hardware that is reversible, and there is kind of a, a, a branch of research in in computer system design where they are making reversible computation. And one of the reasons that that's interesting is because of power consumption, right? Because it turns out like everyone knows uh, uh, the, the relationship between uh, matter and energy e equals mc squared. Well, there's a similar relationship between information and energy and any destruction or creation of information uh, actually consumes energy. Um, and so when when you know when when a program statement executes, when we go a equals a plus one, or particularly when we go a equals b, that's destroying information, right? When that when that a equals b statement executes, what a was before that information is now gone from the universe, and so that consumes energy. And if you build reversible logic, it turns out that actually, in theory at least, and some evidence showing this in practice, that that you that can actually operate with 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 less energy requirement. But that's you know that's a really kind of you know that's a research topic that's not hardware that anybody any of us are likely to get our hands on in the next 10 years we'll probably you know we might even see uh, widespread adoption of quantum computing before we see adoption of reversible logic so so you know to put it back in in reality on on you know commodity hardware that's available today what are we going to do we don't want to save it and recomputing it is 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 basically not possible well there is another way to recompute it and, and that is to rerun the program, right? That is to, ex so we, we can exploit the fact that computers are like fundamentally deterministic things, right? That, I don't know if anybody knows what this is, if anybody recognizes this image. Like if you, if you look closely, you see it's, it's, a, it's a whole bunch of lava lamps. And uh, and you can also see a little bit of advertising there from Cloudflare. So this is actually the Cloudflare's random number generator, right? So the the, the best way to, or one of the best ways to get computers to generate really random numbers is to have them take images of lava lamps and use that to compute a number, right? Because computers are really bad. They just basically can't create random, genuinely random numbers because they're deterministic, right? What this means is if I if I run the same program multiple times, and each time I give it the same starting state and I feed it the same set of inputs, then it will always do the same thing, right? We design computers to be deterministic. So we can exploit that, right? If I just go back to the, if I, if I go back to the state, if I, if I want to, you know, I, I'm at this, I've just executed this statement A equals A plus one, or rather let's see this one, I've just executed this statement A equals B and I, and I want to go back. Well, let's say that's the thousandth instruction that I've executed. If I go back to the start and play forwards 999, then I'll have the state of my machine before that point, right? And that's 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 how you can make it work because the the amount of non-deterministic stuff is a tiny minority uh, of what the computer does, and we can actually uh, capture it. So, 
uh, uh, so if we go, so what we can, now we don't wanna go right the way back to the beginning and play that all the way forwards. What we wanna do is, is uh, go back to a snapshot, right? Because maybe our programs run for a long time. Remember I gave that example earlier on, a program that was running for eight hours before it crashed. And if every time I wanted to go back one instruction, I had to wait, I had to wait eight hours for the whole thing to play all the way through, that's gonna get kind of tedious, right? So what we want is some snapshots and then we can just go back to the preceding snapshot and play that forward to where we need to be. We also need a precise notion of time, right? If I'm at the thousandth instruction, I wanna go back to the 999th instruction, like it's no good to just, you know, go back, uh, gonna get, you know, if I run just a little bit too far forward or stop too early, it's gonna get very confusing very quickly. So we need a very precise notion of time and we need these snapshots. And then the other thing we need is to store non-deterministic events because I just kept saying that computers are completely deterministic. Well, yeah, computers are deterministic except when they're not, right? And actually, if they were entirely deterministic, they'd be kind of useless because every time it would give you the same answer, right? So you'd only need to run every program once. Clearly, programs are not all deterministic. And we have multiple sources of non-determinism uh, into a program. User input is the most obvious, right? Human could type anything, but we could be reading off the network. We could be reading, um, you know, we could, have sh we could be reading from the file system. We could have memory that's shared with, uh, devices or with other applications. Uh, we can have timing differences, especially with multi-threaded code. We might have uh, we might have asynchronous events like signals and things. So, so you know, a whole bunch of things actually can be non can be non-deterministic in practice. And so we need to store them in an event log as the program is running. So when we go back and play forward from a snapshot, we don't actually do the non-deterministic things, right? So if it's reading user input, store that user input into the event log. And then when we want to go back a step, we go back, play forward from a snapshot, and we don't really get the user input when we're replaying, right? We synthesize it based on what's in the event log. And that way, you can get this sort of fully deterministic replay, and you can get this time travel. You can get this ability to, to step or to run backwards. So we've got a couple of um, couple of questions uh, in, the, in the chat. Um, can IntelliJ do this out of the box, or do you use a plugin? No, you do need a plugin. IntelliJ won't do this out of the box. Um, uh, and uh, and so that's what what Jonathan was showing me there, and that's what that's what that's what our company does, right? That's what Undo.io um, 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 provides. We provide the, the capability to do this. And then another question I can just get to on: um, uh, Are there any uh, articles we can recommend on the research topic? I'm assuming that's referring to the reversible logic um, uh, research topic. Uh, I don't, off the top of my head, no, I can dig some out. I mean, you can Google, um, you know, reversible logic. Um, and, um, you know, there's a bunch of um, bunch of articles on there. Um, there you go, Jonathan's, um, Jonathan's uh, put something on the, uh, in, in the chat there. So, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's not a large research field. It's pretty niche, um, but it's very interesting. And it's kind of counterintuitive, right? You thought if, if I make my computer reversible, surely that's going to consume more energy. And it's kind of quite mind bending that, but in fact, it turns out it, 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 it actually doesn't need to. Um, you know, how, how you actually build real systems at scale from this, I think is very much an unsolved, unsolved problem. It's very in, in, the early in the early stages. Okay, so that's kind of, um, that's like what the problem is, how we, how we solve it. I think I'm just gonna get into to one uh, more bit of detail now. This is, uh, what I've said so far, actually, a lot. I'll talk about different systems in a minute. A lot of systems use this event log, snapshot, and replay uh, approach. Um, not not all. Actually, tends to be less so on Windows platform because um, it's actually much harder some, to do with the Windows architecture. It's much more difficult, in fact, basically impossible to to uh, uh, sort of isolate that level to be able to really capture all of the non-deterministic inputs. Um, but certainly, um, there's a there's a there's a couple of different implementations on on, on Linux that, that that do this because it gives you it gives you just more kind of um, the the process model is a little bit more well defined and constrained. But the other thing that you that you need that I mentioned is this uh, is this ability to have a very precise control of time. Um, and if you think about like think about uh, trying to step back through a loop, right? So you know I've I've, I've done let's say I've done a thousand iterations of my loop and I want to step back and my loop's got a few lines of code. I want to step back to the preceding lines of code 
in this same iteration though, I don't want to stop two or three iterations early or two or three iterations later. I want to stop exactly the right time. Also, if I'm going to replay asynchronous events like a thread switch or a signal that comes in from an asynchronous single signal, I need to replay it at exactly the right time. Right? This is why this approach, it works, but it's really hard to get right because you have to be like precise, precise, precise. If you, if you replay an asynchronous event five nanoseconds too late or too early, your replay will just subtly diverge from the original kind of reference implementation from the record implementation. And then other things won't quite work and you'll diverge further and the whole thing will very quickly fall apart. So we need to have a very precise notion of where we are in time. We also need to be able to cope with this, by the way, the way this, this uh, most of these technologies work the same way. We do RR does the Microsoft implementation I talked about work. They, we work at the machine level, right? At the, at the CPU instruction level and then kind of translate back up to Java or whatever high level language you're, you're, you're writing in. And so some of the instructions actually are non-deterministic, right? Most instructions, if I add two numbers together, as long as I've got the same two numbers already in the same starting state, better get the same result, okay? You know, even the even the famous Pentium floating point bug would give you the same answer if you had the same start, same 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 two numbers going in, right? Just wouldn't necessarily be the right one. So most instructions are are, are deterministic, but but others are not, right? So RDTSC that's an x86 instruction to read the timestamp counter. How many clock ticks have there been since we since, since the machine was powered on? It's kind of invented for um, originally invented with the with the uh, to be used for profiling. Um, but actually turned out to be very useful for timekeeping as well, for very efficient timekeeping. Uh, or, you know, getting a CPU ID that can actually tell you what CPU core you're running on. There's actually some instructions uh, on modern Intel hardware. There's uh, get me a random number instruction, right? It's like designed, de totally designed to be, to be, uh, to be non-deterministic. It's not actually totally deterministic, which is why Cloudflare have non-deterministic, which is why Cloudflare have the, the, um, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, lava lamp random number generator but uh but but it, it is for, for all intents and purposes it's very hard to predict uh, what these instructions are going to do syscall instruction right i'm going to issue a syscall maybe it's to like get the process id or maybe it's to read from the file or the network or whatever in fact if the syscall would be predictable based on what's in memory in the first place then it probably shouldn't be a system call it should probably be a library call right so any system call in effect is going to be a non an unpredictable non-deterministic instruction so so the way we want it, the way we handle this is to have a, a JIT, binary JIT, right? So we translate the x86 or the R machine code as it's running into something that's functionally equivalent, but allows us to get our, thing, our, our fingers in and, uh, and, and monitor those, those non-deterministic events and get a very, keep a very, very precise control of time. It actually turns out to be how many, it's almost, not quite, but almost how many branches has my program taken, how many, how many jumps, and that's our, that's the kind of notion that we can just count the jumps and that gives us that, that price, precise control of time. Um, so uh, so that's kind of the, 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 uh, uh, an overview of how it works. I think um, we've got uh, got a couple more questions I'll, I'll answer and then we'll go back to Jonathan for another demo. Um, so from Simon, how much memory will be used, and uh, and and how uh, and how is how is the performance impacted? And uh, uh, excellent question, right? And I talked a lot about scalability, and that's what it's you know, that's that's what this means, right? This is this is you know if I'm going to just store everything, it's going to consume huge amounts of memory, right? It's going to if I'm storing everything that changes, it's going to be on the order of gigabytes per second. Um, so I don't want to do that. I want to store only these non-deterministic inputs. And so the answer on how much memory is consumed is it depends, right? It depends a lot on what your program is doing. If you're computationally expensive, you know, sort of CPU bound, computing, you know, pi to a million decimal places, then it doesn't consume very much memory at all. If your program is receiving 10 gigabit uncompressed stream off of the network, then my event log is gonna get very big because I've got to store all of those inputs, right? So it varies a lot, but typically like, your mileage may vary, but typically we'll see a few megabytes per second of recording, right? So you can record quite a long time. And I, in fact, you can keep recording because it's a circular event log, right? So, so you know, and then you just decide. So actually it's more you decide how much event log am I gonna, how much event log do I want? And then how much time you will fit in that event log, right? how far back you'll be able to wind time will depend on exactly what your program is doing few megabytes per second is, is, is typical. 
So we have some of our customers run with a very, very large event log, you know, hundreds of gigabytes in some cases so that they can li just wind back hours and hours and hours. Usually people run with an event log that's more like a gigabyte in size, and that will typically give them anything from, you know, a, a, a few seconds to many minutes um, of recording. And, and that's a kind of typical kind of size. And then there's the performance aspect. You know, how, how fast does the program run when you're recording? There is some slowdown, right? There's no getting away from it. We, you know, if you think, uh, you know, until we have that reversible logic, there is a little bit of extra work that needs to be done. Again, it depends, but kind of, you know, roughly speaking, 2x to 10x is kind of typical, right? So on a good day, your program will run at half speed. Um, you know, it might run, it might run you know, sort of a tenth speed, quite a lot slower than that. Uh, it does depend on the program and on the system. Um, so it's not something we would recommend for the most part that you kind of deploy in production always on just in case, right? Because it's just a little bit too expensive um, or maybe a lot too expensive in, in practical terms to do that. So people tend to turn it on either when in kind of you know, test environments, right? So I talked earlier on about flaky tests. That's a really good application of this of this technology, right? You, you just, you, you've got these tests, you know they're flaky. You have to turn, take them out of your main test suite because it keeps causing you know, intermittent sporadic failures. So now you can just run those tests all, all with recording just again and again until you get a recording out and then your engineers can, um, you know, can debug them uh, rather than ignore them. Uh, it, you can also deploy in production, right? So, you know, I gave that example uh, earlier on, I'll refer back to that example with Cadence when they had that, that application, that, their application that was crashing after eight hours of execution. Um, so, so they just, what they did is set up a whole bunch of machines left that running over the weekend. So it took more like 20 hours rather than eight, but they just had a whole bunch of machines, let them going over the weekend, came in on Monday morning, a few of them had crashed. They took one of the recordings straight back to the source of the bug within within the, within you know a couple of hours. Um, so, you know, the way I tend to talk about it is compute time is cheap, right? Human time is expensive. So if we can spend a bit of compute time in our test farm or even in production in order to capture the failure so that a human can, can diagnose it much more quickly then that's usually a good trade-off. But of course, it depends on your system and your application. Uh, okay, got another question um, around the commercial aspect. Uh, it's not it's not free to use. Um, uh, there is a free trial, um, but this is commercial software. You know, we're we're a we're a startup company, um, and uh, you know, we've got a, we've got a kind of you know bills to pay and all the rest of it. So it's kind of, it's a, it's a commercial software, a similar sort of model to, you know, to say, uh, to say uh, IntelliJ, at least in the early, in the early days. So um, at least right now and for the time and, you know, for the foreseeable, um, we, we don't have like a community edition or anything like that. Um, but, you know, I would say this with night, but you'll, you'll, you'll get, you'll definitely get, uh, you'll get a good return on your investment and the money saved and the better quality uh, software that you ship. Anyway, enough of this, enough of the commercial um, uh, another question, have I looked at bug jail? Uh, no, uh, I have heard of it. I haven't had a good look at it. I don't know, uh, Jonathan, if, um, if you've seen bug Yeah, jail. I've played with it a bit. It's, um, there are various time travel debug solutions available, um, depending on what platform we're on, whether we're on Windows or Linux or, or actually it's mostly those two. Um, different trade-offs between recording time speed um, the kind of granularity of what you can record and replay um, and size of the recording file. Uh, so it's one of these things where I suggest probably you probably just want to use it yourself in um, in your own on your own application and kind of make your own judgment. Um, we so we obviously have our product and we're quite happy with the kind of trade-offs that we make around this this area, but you really probably should try out a few things or try out what, what's available to you depending on the platform you're interested in. Yeah, yeah. so there's, 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 um, yeah, there's a number, uh, Tundra is another one. There's a, there's a, there's a number of um, it's kind of, you know, time travel or, or sometimes get, sometimes has been called replay debugging, sometimes reversible debugging. The, the world seems to be standardizing on, on time travel debugging as, as terminology. But but yeah, the, I mean, I, I see this very much, as I said earlier on, as, a, as an idea whose time has come. Um, obviously, our implementation is best, but you need to go and make that judgment for yourself. 
Um, and then one more question, is, is this debugging tool supposed to be used in production environments as well? Um, and I, the answer is yes, but, right? So yes, um, uh, uh, it absolutely we're used in, in production. Tends not to be, as I sort of alluded to earlier, tends not to be a kind of turn it on all the time, um, you know, just in case kind of use. I mean, I think it'd be really interesting to get that to that point in the future. I think as, this, as the technology, you know, both our product and other products matures, I think that might be somewhere where we get to in the future. But right now, right now it's more, uh, you know, you kind of turn it on when you need it. Um, because, you know, frankly, because of those performance overheads, right? Most, most people pretty much, you know, not really very many people who can afford to be, uh, you know, running everything at half speed or, or, or even worse than that, you know, all of the time. Um, but you can't totally deploy it in production, right? You don't need like a special environment or, a, you know, like a special virtualized system or kind of some kind of hardware support or special kernel. So, like it is, it is absolutely designed to be able to deploy, uh, uh, you know, anywhere, right? Um, and and then you know you, you need to sort of make those um, those those performance uh, you know sort of trade offs as Jonathan was alluding to. So so let's get into another demo now and um, and and see a bit more uh, 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 see some something that might hopefully give us another another sort of sense on on what this kind of technology can do. Happily, um, the demo was. Um was planning to show um, kind of follows on from that last question. This isn't really a production environment, but it, it's demoing more like kind of pre-production or staging environment. Uh, so I've got a really simple little service running here. Um, it, you uh, give it um, a name uh, and it uh, replies uh, with a little reply. So obviously, again, as you may have guessed, this is a toy, but I'm hoping you can extrapolate to your own world. So uh, if I don't give it a name and just invoke it without any, oh dear, I've suddenly got a 500. So that's not good. Um, how would I go about diagnosing this? So I am, what I've done is I've added some uh, little API calls into this service and exposed another endpoint that uh, allows me to make the service record itself. So uh, the endpoint is lr for j because our product's called Live Recorder for Java. But so I can call that endpoint and that's caused the application to start recording itself. Uh, I then can rerun that bad query that calls a null pointer exception uh, and uh, it reruns it but because I've turned recording on it's now running under recording so I'll turn recording off and and write out um, a file this will take a moment uh, again using this extra endpoint I, I've added into this service to um, allow it to record itself so that's generated a recording file. Um, I'm now going to replay it. I'm going to replay this uh, on the um, same container in which I recorded it, which probably isn't great practice, but it, it's a demo, so I hope you'll forgive me. Um, so now I'm using that same um, container that contains the service to um, replay. So in IntelliJ again, I'm going to debug this, um, load it into IntelliJ, takes a moment to load up. So you'll need to be patient. Yeah, it hasn't actually connected yet. Did I, actually, did I hit that button? Oh, <laughs> live, <laughs> live demos. Um, yeah, I think it's just, being really slow on my machine. Here we are. Okay, so I've loaded into that recording that was taken out of that, uh, made of that service, and um, it's a little toy. So we are immediately at the point of failure because um, I knew where it was going to fail. So you can see that it's basically just failing because the, the name was null. So this is a kind of tiny little toy, but um, 
I hope you can extrapolate from this to how it can be used in a kind of pre-production or indeed a production if you, if you can take the slow down hit environment. Uh, the idea is you take that recording out of the uh, environment in which it was made and then you can just replay it on your desktop. So that's all I wanted to demo. Back to you, Greg. Cool. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, let me uh, share my screen now. So I'll just finish off, uh, I'll that to load, and then I'll finish off uh, uh, just talking a little bit more, tiny bit more about implementation, and, uh, and then we'll do a kind of review um, and, and then um, and, and then we can um, have kind of free form chat. Um, so 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 yeah. So the, we, we we call it in process virtualization, right? This ability to capture at a process level on a Linux system everything that's happening. This is all very Linux specific, I should say. I know this is a Java uh, a, a, a Java group. We, we it, other languages are supported as well. So so C plus plus and and, uh, and Go. Um, and Rust as well, um, but obviously um, we're, we're interested mainly in Java here. But of course, most systems these days you have multiple languages all kind of uh, 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 making up the application. Um, uh, it is Linux specific, um, um, but in in the future, my, my my hope is that we will begin to interact seamlessly with other implementations on other on other platforms, um, and, and we'll talk about some of that in a bit. So. So we kind of sit on the Linux system, just right above the kernel, right below user level. So even like libc and all that stuff, we're underneath that. We're recording the execution. We're not recording the kernel, but we're recording everything uh, in in the, in the user level process, including system libraries um, and, and and everything else. And then you can replay that like basically anywhere, right? You don't need the same machine. Um, you don't even need the same system, right? You can take the recording on a on a Red Hat system and and replay it. Uh, on an Ubuntu, on an Ubuntu. In fact, you can either even replay it on a um, on a on a Docker or or a Whistle on a on a Windows system, right? Um, and actually, I'm not in uh, I'm not in present mode. Hang on, just a second. Uh, oh, well, my, my flow's gone a bit wrong. Hang on, I'll come back to that. One of the things we discovered. Sort of fairly early on when 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 building this is I th I thought we were going to be able to exploit the 80-20 rule, right? That you know 80% of applications would only do about 20% of the things they might do. So in terms of like we've got to know all the system calls that might happen, you know, that's kind of the main, that's kind of the broader one. But you know, any signals, threads, shared memory, all that stuff we've got to deal with. But I kind of figured, you know, I reckon we can do tw cover 20% of the state space and we'll have covered. 80% of the applications. Um, that did not turn out to work, um, to be true, sadly. In the real world, because most applications have all kinds of libraries, you know, and if you're Java, you've got your JVM inside the process, but that you've probably got all kinds of other you know, libraries that have been dragged in and, 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 and components. And, 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 and it turns out, actually, you don't get the 80-20 rule here. You get, 19, you get the 99-99 rule. 99% of applications actually Touch, seem to touch like 99% of the space and everything, you're using shared memory even if you don't realize it, right? Um, because you're because there'll be some library or some piece of the runtime that's using it. You're, you're using threads even if you don't think you are because the JVM will be under your feet. You're using basically, and you're using all kinds of weird and wonderful system calls that you didn't, you probably didn't realize. Um, so it turned out, turns out you do need to cover like basically all of the state in, in order for this uh, to work. I'll go back uh, to my slides slightly out of order. I think it's worth saying I don't want to, I shouldn't, I don't, um, I don't want to come across as uh, like anti-logging and anti-printf debugging and stuff. Actually, I think logging uh, will and tracing will always be a really important part of how we debug software. And they actually give you, um, it's, it's a very useful way of getting a story of what my application has done, a kind of high level story, the, the different kind of phases it's been through, roughly where it is, roughly what's happened. It just doesn't give me the detail to get to, to or very rarely does it give me the detail to, to actually go all the way and home in and, and fix the issue. So I think the future of debugging is not 
that time travel debugging is going to replace traditional debuggers or time travel debugging is going to replace logging, I think actually it all works together. You've seen how time travel debugging actually fits inside a traditional debugger, just gives that extra kind of capability. But also I think the logging gives you the story. And one of the things we've been working on that we don't have a demo for you today, unfortunately, but is the, the we, we, a thing we call log jump. And so the idea is I take my log of my program execution and I want to click on a line of that log output and go straight to the line of code that generated that log output and then step back a few lines from there or maybe a long way from there to see what happened, right? So I think, you know, this isn't, this isn't like one debugging technology to rule them all. This is fitting into an ecosystem and uh and 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 to be i said at the beginning of the talk to be a, to be a, to be a great programmer you have to be great at debugging and to be really good at debugging you have to be able to use all of the tools or not all of the tools but but you know several tools at your disposal the right tool for the job um read through that so let's just talk briefly about um some of the uh, some of the different sort of implementations that are out there i'm not going to do the kind of table of uh, crosses and ticks against like, what the different things can do, but I can just give a brief kind of overview. So, so, so undo, so you've seen the stuff I've mentioned that um, I mentioned the, the live recorder um, and you've seen some demos there. There's a thing um, uh, on Linux, uh, an open source thing called RR, stands for record and replay. Um, and that's a nice, that's a nice bit of technology. It's similar kind of implementation in um in in at a high level anyway but of that sort of deterministic replay from a snapshot um uh works with c plus plus works with rust um somewhat works with go although um it goes a bit tricky because of uh, uh go routines but but it, it does it does you know it does work pretty pretty well it works very well with what it does but it's a little bit limited on where it will work um so you, you but it doesn't run particularly doesn't run on on, um, on most aws machines and stuff like that because it relies on uh getting access to the hardware performance counters underneath um, but where it will work it's it's very good and it's fast as well um uh but doesn't uh, doesn't support java which i guess is is relevant for this crowd um there's also uh, inside gdb again it supports similar languages uh, an inbuilt thing in gdb um process record it's very slow that works on the basis you know i said earlier on you can record everything that happened all of the state changes that's how gdp inbuilt process record works um so very slow and and you know consumes uh gigabytes of recording for per second of like at least of what would execute um, um but is available and does work on windows um you know many I, i've just sort of given a few examples here there are there are many we saw in the chat um, this is not an exhaustive list at all, um, but but Microsoft are getting into this in quite a big way um, across C plus plus and C sharp and JavaScript. There's, a, there's another startup company called RevDebug. You have a solution for Java uh, on Windows, and uh, that's pretty that's that's pretty good actually. Um, uh, so if you're if, if you're on the Windows platform, you should definitely check them out. Um, there are some cross-platform tools, but they're kind of really the previous generation. Um, Cronon on Omniscient actually, I, I, it's kind of, unfortunately that that's the original project that I referred to. That kind of I think really, it's not the original original, but it's certainly the first one that I saw and kind of brought some of this stuff into wider consciousness. It's kind of discontinued as a project. Um, there is a GitHub page. I I tried to I tried to um, actually get it to work a little while ago. I couldn't I couldn't make it work. I think it it, it needs some love. Um, and there's another thing, Cronon um uh which uh which which is again java java based and again it's kind of cross-platform the reason the cross-platform things are kind of um really the previous generation and kind of um not really kept up to date and and and, and they don't really perform very well um it's because you, you can't right if you're going to perform well if you're going to scale you need to really you know you need to get down into the really you know integrate tightly with the system um, so I think that's why, you know, you're seeing, um, you know, different implementations for different platforms. Um, so the kind of the modern generation of this stuff, I think this, this is just, it's too hard to make scale in, in a cross platform way. Um, but they do exist and, and you certainly, I think Cronon, you can still, I'm only seeing probably just doesn't seem to be usable at the moment. Maybe someone will pick it up. Cronon, I think you can still use, um, yeah, it's kind of slow, but, uh, it, it does let you select what you want to record. So it can actually be useful in some situations. Um, so that's it. Then uh, just a brief kind of recap on 
on what we've covered in the talk today, and then I think we can go into the into the kind of networking session. So, um, uh, yeah, uh, computers are hard, and, uh, and and humans just are not really very good at writing code, right? And I think as humans, we need to accept that we need help. Um, I think it's I haven't really spoken about this today, but I think it's really strange actually how little focus there is in the industry on on debugging as a thing, right? But you know, there are way more conferences and books and 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 tools and companies around things like performance profiling and um, you know, sort of I don't know, language design and uh, uh, you know, even kind of like source control and alerting and monitoring. You know, and, and actually, like all these things, now I'm not, I'm not dismissing any of these things. They're all very important, right? But it just, it's just striking to me how little kind of attention there is in the industry to debugging compared to like some of these other stuff. And I would say debugging is at least as important as uh, as, as all this other stuff. And, uh, and, and as I said earlier on, I think, you know, completely uh, dominates software development. And maybe it's one of those things that dominates software development so much that we just don't even really notice it, right? We're kind of like the frogs who've been boiled in the in in the pot. Um, uh, record and replay time travel debugging. Which is about this slide. Time travel debugging is is awesome as we've seen. I think that's a key takeaway. And um, and it's an interesting sort of observation from this that under the hood, when it comes down to it, most programs do most of the things. At least once you get away from any kind of toy stuff. So, thank you very much, everyone, for listening uh, and watching our demos. Um, and some ex and, and thank you for the excellent questions in the chat. Uh, that concludes the talk. Thank you very much, Greg and Jonathan, for the demo. It was very interesting to see that type of uh, debugging, and I think it, as you said, very helpful for everyone. Um, just an outlook to the next events. We will have uh, two that are already announced. One is about Docker's code from Ralph D. Muller. And the other one is Good Habits for Developers from Alex Boyboka. Uh, plus, there will be a special event with uh, Sandro Mancuso um, about software craftsmanship, and he will do a fireside chat. So there will be no slides. He will answer your questions. You can already answer your question on the Slack channel if you like, and you then will have uh, the possibility during the talk to uh, answer live. Uh, um, questions and he will um, do that. And uh, this session or this event will be in cooperation with Software Craftsmanship uh, Community Romandi. Um, so this will be a joint event for us. And yes, we want you. So if you like to talk um, on a Java user group event, feel free uh, to contact us. Um, you can send us an email or use the Slack channel or right here in the chat or after in the networking event on WonderMe. And uh, even if you have uh, such an, just an ID and want to uh, hear about a specific type, topic, let us know as well. We will try to organize a speaker for uh, that topic as well. Uh, in a few days, you will uh, be able to see uh, the live recording of uh, this talk on YouTube. Uh, you can subscribe there, the URL is uh, yt.juk.ch and you will see all the uh, previous events and also this one in a few days when we are finished in editing. Um, there is, as I said, a Slack channel. You can uh, ask questions, you can get in contact with us. So uh, use this as well. And uh, that's it from Java User Group. So we, you will be uh, redirected to WonderMe, and um, you will be there, and Greg will be here, and Jonathan, and you can uh, ask any more questions that you didn't during the talk. Thanks a lot for coming, and I hope to see you next time.